Galur I call the Assembly to order, and the item on our agenda is questions to the First Minister. And the first question, Janet Finch Saunders. First Minister, make a statement on the Welsh Government's public procurement priorities. Well, procurement policy is focused on meeting the challenge of austerity whilst maximising opportunity for Welsh business and creating sustainable jobs as we exit the EU. Thank you. First Minister, as you are aware, the number of people waiting more than a year for surgery in Wales has increased this year by 400%. Now, in order to get those lists down, health boards are forced to procure some services and health treatments outside Wales. In my own health board, I am aware of several referrals to the Priory Clinic for those wishing to access vital mental health services and treatment to reduce the waiting list for operations that cannot be performed in good time in Wales. Our NHS is now spending £255 million procuring that treatment for people outside of Wales in one year, and the total number of patients is 46,000 patients. First Minister, we've had devolution now for 20 years and still we're having to procure much needed health services outside of Wales. What steps will you be taking to ensure that our patients receive the treatment they require in good time and most importantly in their own locality and you know, more available than it is currently? Well, I, I do know that her party has expressed very strong views, uh, which I agree with. Uh, that people should not be prevented from accessing treatment across the border. Uh, and I think it's important that where uh, treatment is available, people should have access to it. We should not seek to create a situation where we try to uh, make available all treatment in Wales. There will be some specialist treatment, but there will have to be accessed in, uh, from bigger cities. Uh, where we can provide uh, treatment, we will. I mean, one example of that is the CERNIC, uh, where the original recommendation was to move the service out of Wales. Uh, I commissioned a review and as a result of that review, uh, it was possible then to move ahead with the CERNIC. So, where we can, uh, we will, but we shouldn't be afraid of procuring uh, services uh, outside of Wales if that's what patients need. Vicky Howells. First Minister, how does the Welsh Government plan to use procurement levers in the context of the Valley's Task Force Delivery Plan to uh, create jobs and boost prosperity in the Northern Valleys? Well, the Valleys Task Force Action Plan commits us to using public procurement innovatively so we can exploit the job creation potential from the major infrastructure investments uh, that we have uh, in Wales. For example, programmes like the South Wales Metro, the major road schemes at like the M4, and the ongoing work to do with the A465 uh, will embed a community benefit approach uh, to ensure that uh, outcomes are closely monitored so that communities get the maximum uh, benefit from the schemes that are moving forward in their areas. Question die, Rhiannon. Deal, what assessment has the First Minister made of the impact that the UK Government's austerity programme has had in Wales? Well, with the £1 billion left to spend on public services in Wales, uh, clearly, of course, uh, there is a great deal uh, of pressure. And, of course, uh, we have called on the UK Government to end this period of austerity. And that, I hope, is uh, a message that will be heard by, uh, by the Chancellor of the Exchequer at the end of this month. Uh, dear First Minister, the UK Tory Government's Chancellor, Philip Hammond, will deliver his budget on the 22nd of November in the House of Commons Chamber. Recently, the Welsh and Scottish Finance Ministers jointly met with Treasury officials at the Finance Quadrilateral Meeting in London. At that meeting, the Welsh and Scottish Finance Ministers delivered a clear and ambiguous call for the UK Tory Government to set out plans to lift the public sector pay gap and reverse the planned further £3.5 billion of unallocated cuts in expenditure in 2019-20. What message does the First Minister have for the Chancellor of the Exchequer in advance of the budget for the need for the Tory Government to abandon its ideological obsession with austerity, considering the Welsh Government has seen its budget cut by 7% in real terms since 2010? Well, first of all, it's hugely important that the £3.5 billion of unallocated cuts are disposed of to make sure that uh, we are able to uh, be in a position where we do not bear the extent of those cuts. Uh, secondly, it's hugely important now, I believe, for the economy to have more money pumped into it, to make sure there's more money for investment, to make sure that jobs can be created as a result, and, of course, to enable the Welsh Government and indeed the Scottish Government to be able to invest in the infrastructure that uh, Wales and Scotland need. Mark Reckless. Uh, First Minister, you described your approach to the public finances on the 23rd of April when you were asked the Shadow Chancellor John McDonnell said 500 billion more borrowing 
is in order to give the economy a bit of a boost. You'd go along with that then, would you? You answered, yes, I would. Do you still think borrowing £500 billion, ten times the current UK deficit, would be sensible, and how would it be repaid? I do believe uh, that it's hugely important that at a time when borrowing has never been, well, not quite as cheap as it was a week or so ago, but borrowing is historically cheap, that it is reasonable and responsible for governments to borrow money in order to pump that money into the economy. He will disagree. He's a monetarist, I'm sure. I'm not. I, I adhere to a Keynesianism, and I take the view that now is the time for a government to borrow that money, inject the money into the economy, create the jobs that, that we need, and then, of course, create the tax receipts that will pay that loan back. Adam Price. Yes. If that is the case, and I agree with you, First Minister, um, because of the historic uh, low interest rates that we're still facing, notwithstanding the recent decision uh, to have a, a slight increase, uh, why aren't we borrowing at the full amount available to us? I mean, we, we are not actually even drawing down over the next three financial years the full 425 million that we could uh, borrow. We're 50 million short of that. We could be doing more through the mutual investment model as well. Why aren't we using the borrowing powers that we have to the full effect? Well, the answer is we, we are. Uh, we have to balance, of course, the, uh, the, the, the power that we have to borrow money against the need to pay that money back uh, and the pressures that will be on the revenue budget in years to, uh, to come. Uh, we're moving ahead with the mutual investment model, as the uh, member has said, and we will explore all uh, models uh, of prudent financial borrowing in order to deliver the people of Wales. Christina Naurga Narwa. Questions now from the party leaders, Leader of the Opposition, Andrew Archie Davis. Officer, uh, First Minister, recently we've had allegations put by a former Cabinet Minister and by a senior Special Advisor that in the last Assembly Government that you were First Minister to, there was bullying, mind games, favouritism, deliberate personal undermining, deliberate personal undermining and, allowing, and that culture was allowed to flourish unchecked. Also, the Special Advisor cited the behaviour as being pure poison. Could I ask you to comment on those allegations, First Minister, as if they are correct, then that is no way to run a government, is it? Well, uh, first of all, uh, can I say that I have heard the allegations of bullying by uh, Leighton Andrews. Um, I listened to what he has to say. I heard what Steve Jones had to say. And what I will say is, uh, is this. Uh, if people wish to come forward uh, to me and uh, explain things to me uh, about their experience, uh, then I'm more than willing for that to happen, and they can contact me either through my office or through the uh, Permanent Secretary. First Minister, the allegations are levelled very much at your office, uh, and the allegations or the people making the allegations state quite clearly that they raised these allegations with you on numerous occasions and just gave up. They just gave up. They, they believed that they weren't being taken seriously and these issues were not being addressed. And indeed, in an assembly written question to my colleague Darren Miller, who asked a question back in November, October, November 2014, uh, you actually responded to him by saying that no allegations had been made. How can people have confidence that if they do choose to raise these serious concerns with you, that they will be taken seriously? And in the absence of them having that confidence, would you commit to referring these allegations for investigation by an independent third party so that we can fully understand whether they are serious allegations that stack up and actions required, or they have no substance and they can be discarded? I think it's hugely important that where people have concerns, they're able to express uh, those concerns through a confidential process. I don't think um, doing it through, uh, in the public uh, domain is the way to, uh, to do these things. And I invite people to come forward with any concerns that they might have and contact my office or contact the Permanent Secretary so I can make an assessment of what was, what was said to be happening at that time. Is it fair to say, though, First Minister, that these allegations were raised with you at the time because both individuals, senior individuals within the government, are categorical in their allegations that they say they were raised on numerous occasions with you, not just on one-off occasions, but they were raised on numerous occasions with you, and indeed they were levelled at your office, they were. They weren't levelled at the wider government structure, they were levelled at the office of First Minister. So can you confirm that, not like the answer you gave Darren Miller back in 2014, that these allegations were raised with you? and that you did investigate them at that time. And as I said, if they do stack up, will you commit 
to referring them to an independent person so that they can be looked into and actually these actions addressed? What I can say is that any issues that were brought to my attention at that time were dealt with. Uh, and that's what the answer was given, uh, and, I, and that answer is correct, back in 2014. Uh, if, however, uh, there are other issues that people want to bring forward, then they are welcome to, uh, to do so. But he asked the direct question, were these issues, uh, were any issues raised with me dealt with? The answer to that is, yes, they were dealt with. Leader of the UKIP Group, Neil Hamilton. Well, I'm sure the First Minister would have seen <coughs> this morning in Wales Online that Martin Shipton has written a piece about the subject that the Leader of the Opposition has, has raised. And he said that he was invited to a dinner in late 2014 at a friend's home where Carl Sargent and other senior Welsh Labour figures gave him a disturbing insight into an aspect of the Welsh Government he wasn't familiar with. And it said that he was shocked to hear from Carl and others of the poisonous atmosphere that existed at the heart of Welsh Government, claims of instances of undermining and petty sniping that went on, that you had been told of these problems but hadn't done anything about them. So does that not fly in the face of what you've just said to the Leader of the Opposition? I cannot possibly comment on uh, issues that I have no knowledge of, but if um, the journalists involved or others want to come forward and share uh, what they have said, unknown to me, uh, with me, I'd be more than happy to listen to them. Well, I'm sure the First Minister will agree that out of the tragedy <coughs> of the, the last few days, it's important that we should learn lessons. And arising out of um, Carl Sargent's dismissal and the processes that were involved in that, the First Minister, as a barrister experienced in criminal law and procedure, uh, said that he acted by the book. Now, Carl Sargent was given no opportunity to answer to him the allegations which had been made because no details were given. That flies in the face of one of the most fundamental uh, principles of natural justice, to hear the other side of the argument before somebody is disadvantaged. <clears throat> uh, also, because the sacking was inevitably public, and the fact that allegations, although unstated, uh, had been made of sexual impropriety, uh, the publicity generated thereby was inevitably prejudicial, uh, which again imperils the presumption of innocence. So if the First Minister acted by the book in this particular instance, does he now think that that book should be thrown away and replaced by another one which is informed by principles of fairness? Well, I think there are two things here. First of all, with the independent inquiry and with the inquest, I think it's hugely important that the whole story is told at once uh, and not bits. Uh, and so I, I, I'm not able to comment on various things that have been said. I think it's right for anybody. I think it's hugely important the whole story is there for all to see, rather than it come out in, in bits and pieces. I think that, that would be the, the, the right process at all. Secondly, uh, do I think there are lessons for all parties to learn? There may be. I think it's important that, um, that we, as political parties, do that. Politics is a very difficult business. We know that. Uh, people can be sacked from cabinets. They can be put into cabinets with any, without any reason. Uh, people can go to an election count, and they can find themselves in a job and then find themselves out of a job while a cheering crowd applauds the fact they're not in a job. And it is, in that sense, a very brutal business. But one of the things that uh, struck me earlier on today is perhaps as parties, we should consider how to take, not the edge, not the need for forensic examination, not the debate, uh, not the scrutiny out of politics, but to see how we can make it less brutal than it is. And I think that that's something that, is all, as all parties, uh, we may want to consider in the future. Well, I, of course, have personal experience of being sacked, and I can confirm it's not pleasant. But nobody who is in politics can actually complain with any justice about being sacked, because uh, there's no justice about appointments in, in the first place. But, but the point in this particular instance was that the sacking was associated with the allegations which have been made against him. There is another way in which the First Minister could have dealt with this because uh, Carl Sargent, as a Minister of the Crown, is governed by the Ministerial Code of Conduct as well, which says that Ministers of the Crown are expected to behave in a principled way that upholds the highest standards of propriety. And Damien Green, the First Minister, has been made subject of... Uh, allegations of sexual impropriety, and, and those are being investigated, not by an internal party uh, uh, investigation, uh, but by Sue Gray, who's the Director General of the Civil Service Propriety and Ethics Team. 
By contrast, the route which the First Minister chose was to send his special advisor to, in, in, to, to speak to the complainants. Um, the solicitors now acting for Carl Sargent's family say that, uh, that uh, to appoint a political activist in these circumstances with no special expertise in undertaking a preliminary disciplinary investigation actually prejudices the outcome of this process. And it's actually as unfair to those who are making the allegations as to those who are subject to them because uh, if there are uncertainties now about the credibility of any ev evidence which is caused by that because as the solicitors for Carl Sargent's family have said there's a real possibility that the evidence of witnesses is being manipulated and because of numerous conversations with witnesses by the First Minister's office creates uncertainty about that cre credibility it really undermines the whole process for everybody that's involved in it so would it not be better in future for these things to be examined independently of the political process itself? Uh, I think we should be very careful about suggesting that the, the words that he has used, the real possibility of manipulation, is a very, very serious suggestion and would need some very strong evidence to back it up. The family have asked for there to be an, an independent inquiry. I have uh, ensured that steps are now moving ahead for that independent inquiry to, to move forward. It would not be right for the family if I were to go into the detail of events because it would seem convenient to do so for me, and I'm not prepared to do that, uh, rather than allow the inquiry to take its full course and then, of course, for all events to be examined at that time. I realise that there are some who will think me evasive as a result of saying that, but I do think it's hugely important that all this is examined. I have, you know, I, I, I have said that this is important, I understand that, it's important for the family, but it's important that all this is examined and a full picture presented at the right time. Uh, I think the family is owed that. First Minister, I've already set out my view over the weekend um, regarding the difficult situation facing the Welsh Government and, of course, Welsh politics as a whole. Plaid Cymru is not prepared to make premature statements about anyone's political future. The issues have not yet been dealt with and the decisions that were made have not yet been examined. We do believe that questions must be an answered and we support and call for the uh, independent inquiry. With the inquest having already begun, can you confirm the timescale for the independent inquiry into the circumstances leading up to Carl Sargent's death? Well, the, the first thing to do, of course, is for a QC to be appointed. Uh, for the terms of reference to be set, and then, of course, it's entirely a matter for the uh, QC who will act at, at arm's length. Uh, that process will need now to proceed um, as quickly as possible. I did notice uh, one of the comments the coroner made yesterday was that he seemed to indicate that the inquiry would influence uh, one of the outcomes of his inquest. Uh, we need to clarify exactly what, um, what that means, whether he wants the inquest to conclude bef uh, the inquiry rather to conclude before the inquest or not. I think that's something that needs to be, to be clarified. But from my perspective, uh, I want to make sure that, that matters now proceed uh, as, uh, as swiftly as possible. And I think we can take a First Minister that once that information becomes available, you'd be prepared to share it with the Assembly as well. Following um, last week, there are questions over how we can ensure that disclosures are dealt with in a way that's fair to everyone involved. Now, I found myself asking, how do we as political parties have the resources and the trained personnel to deal with alleg allegations and to operate in a transparent way? Or could they be dealt with in a more independent way in the future? Uh, an independent and neutral authority <coughs> might be more trusted, more impartial, more transparent than political parties are, are able to be. Now, the Office of the Standards Commissioner may not have the resources at present <coughs> to deal with disclosures of harassment or other misconduct in full. <coughs> There's also a question about sanctions, what kind of sanctions could be placed on people. Do you believe that the Office of Standards Commissioner could be equipped with better resources and that uh, they should also look at meaningful sanctions to deal with such disclosures? I think the Leader of Plaid Cymru has, has raised a hugely important point, uh, and that is how can we create a complaints process uh, that's different, uh, not weaker, 
a different a complaints process that supports all parties. We, you know, we have to be honest. We are this is we are a small country, and we are we are all small parties. And I think there is great merit in exploring uh, with the presiding officer uh, how the standards commissioner might uh, change roles from the, the current role. And I think that is something that, that um, useful discussion could be had amongst the parties. We know that um, sexual harassment occurs elsewhere in politics and in other industries as well. In fact, we can say that it exists in almost every walk of life. It remains a problem experienced by many people, uh, not exclusively, but mainly women. And it remains an issue that needs to be tackled. One point we need to consider, all of us, I think, is how we can create the conditions and the culture for those who have experienced sexual harassment to be able to make disclosures safely in the future. Looking beyond the issue of uh, disclosures and anonymity, can you tell us what steps could be taken to ensure that attitudes change so that harassment can be prevented from taking place in the first place? I think that is a question for all parties working together to, uh, to resolve. We have to create a situation where complainants don't feel they're not able to come forward. Uh, and we have to create a system, yes, we, we want to make sure every system is, is fair, everybody understands that. Uh, and from my perspective, I want to, uh, to make sure that working together as uh, political parties, we can create the, the correct atmosphere. Uh, and also to make sure, of course, that uh, we are able to ensure uh, that the processes, uh, if, there are, if there are new processes followed in the future, that uh, they apply to all parties uh, equally. Uh, there are many questions, I think, that, that will be answered. The leader of Plaid is absolutely right to say that um, there are bound to be questions. I accept that. Uh, and those are questions that, that people want the answers to. And I accept that uh, as well. Uh, and I think as political parties, uh, we just need to see whether there is a way of changing the way that the, the Assembly deals with these uh, issues, and those are conversations we, will need, we may well need to have over the next uh, few weeks. Question three, Jenny. Question three, Jenny Rathbone. How will the Welsh Government deal with the anticipated spike in child poverty in Wales as a result of changes to welfare benefits? Well, I'm concerned about the significant projected increase in child poverty in Wales, driven by the UK Government's planned tax and benefits changes. Our child uh, poverty strategy does set out objectives for tackling child poverty and we're taking action to ensure every child has the best start in life. Um, the Institute of Fiscal Studies uh, has uh, calculated that in Wales we will see a spike of 7% uh, in uh, the, uh, the rate of increase in child poverty which obviously is statistically huge. Uh, and we know that those on uh, working age benefits are seeing a real cut in the amount of money they uh, get to live off. Um, what do you think that can be done to mitigate the, um, the policies of the UK government that obviously are not of our making, but what can we in Wales do to try and mitigate the, the appalling impact that this is likely to have on children in this situation? Well, let me give um, my colleague a, a, a number of uh, ways in which we are dealing uh, with that issue. Uh, early implementation of the childcare offer is taking place in seven local authorities, uh, started in September, uh, delivering uh, childcare of four, to 4,725 children. Uh, for 27 to 18, uh, we've invested over £38 million pounds in the Families First programme, more than £76 million pounds in Flying Start. We have allocated a budget of £400,000 for 2017-18 to 18 for positive uh, parenting. Uh, Communities for Work, for example, has engaged with 11,000 participants, with 3,000 entering into employment. Uh, those are just some examples of what we are doing in order to alleviate child poverty in Wales. Mark Ashwood. Thank you. Well, we know that the figures show that, as a general rule, children growing up in working households do better in, in school and adult life. How do you respond to concern uh, expressed uh, since the recent publication of the Office of National Statistic figures for 2016, showing that the number of uh, children living in long-term workless households fell by 92,000 across the UK last year? Uh, down in Scotland, Northern Ireland uh, and England, and it's actually down by half a million since 2010, but actually increased uh, in Wales. Well, I think, first of all, if we look at our figures, historically we have seen uh, an increase in the rate of employment in Wales and a decrease in the rate of unemployment. 
but it's not sufficient uh, simply to look at whether people are in work or not because we have to look beyond that and understand what people are earning. We used to say that if people found a job, then that was the route out of poverty, yet we know uh, that in-work poverty is uh, one of the scourges that we have. We know, we've heard stories of nurses having to use uh, food banks. And that's why it's so important, I believe, now for there to be a loosening of the bonds of austerity by the UK government, for money to be made available for the devolved governments to make sure that we can look now uh, to improve the incomes of our public sector workers, many of whom, of course, uh, have struggled in terms of uh, their pay rises for some years. Question, Pedwar, David. Question four, David Rees. Will the First Minister make a statement on the future role of Enterprise Zones in Wales? Yes, the Enterprise Zone programme has a strong track record of delivery with over 10,000 jobs having been supported across the eight zones in Wales. <clears throat> and we do remain committed to supporting the programme, which has served as a catalyst for development and investment. Thank you for that answer, First Minister. And in July, your Cabinet Secretary for Economy and <coughs> Infrastructure made a statement on Enterprise Zones in which he stated that the Enterprise Zone programme continues to contribute to the Welsh Government's objectives for its programme of government, and I fully support that. Last month, in a letter to myself, he stated the strategy for the Portalbot Waterfront Enterprise Zone, I quote, is based around established employment sites in the area which have significant capacity for supporting further business investment. And he goes on to say that the Welsh Government is continuing to build on the world-class advanced manufacturing skills in the area to create jobs and employment. Now, I fully support that ambition and the direction of economic growth for Batalbot uh, and want to see it come to fruition, in fact, particularly as the long-term future of the steelworks is still unclear with the joint venture, not having the detail yet for that disincorporated joint venture, or the relay in the blast and the being made quite specific yet. Now, First Minister, as you know, the Enterprise Zone in Batalbot actually includes Baglin Industrial Park, with this associated covenant, which says it's to be used for industrial purposes. Therefore, can I ask you to listen, not just to my voice, but to the voices of over 8,500 of my constituents, uh, and reject approaches by the Ministry of Justice to use that land for a prison, but instead stick to the Welsh Government's plans to use all the land within the Enterprise Zone to support business investment that delivers economic growth and job creation based upon the skills based within Batalbot. I can tell you, a prison will not do that. Well, uh, my friend of the for Aberavon has been uh, a staunch advocate for the views of, I've seen them, and many in his constituency who have opposed the prison. What I can say to him is that, uh, as a government, we have written a letter to the Ministry of Justice. We have sought urgent clarification of, uh, in terms of a number of questions that we have asked. I've not yet seen a response, uh, but uh, the response to that letter will inform our further consideration uh, in terms of how the land might be used. Russell George. Um, First Minister, since the creation of the Emma Vale Enterprise Zone, uh, 94.6 million has been spent to create, safeguard or assist uh, just 390 jobs. That's figures published by the Welsh Government. So that's a cost um, of around a quarter of a million per job. Um, now, given that uh, the key plank of enterprise zones is job creation, these, these figures indicate uh, to me that there's a huge level of investment um, has not been good value for money. Can Wales afford another five years of um, investment on this kind of scale um, for the kind of return that I've highlighted? Well, I have to say to the uh, member that uh, enterprise zones take time uh, to come to uh, full fruition. Uh, a huge amount of investment has gone into the Abbeville area. We see, of course, what has happened on the old steelworks site. We're seeing the uh, the dueling of the A465, which will help um, uh, Ebbervale and the, uh, the surrounding uh, communities. And, of course, uh, we know that uh, he will know that we are investing a substantial uh, sum in developing a uh, technology park uh, in, the, in the area. With enterprise zones, they have to be judged in the long term rather than the short. Dyloid. Uh, Thank you very much, Lewis. Albert Waterfront uh, Enterprise Zone. Um, plainly, as uh, Dave Rees has outlined, um, Local people do not want a super prison on that site, and as the landowner, the Welsh Government can prevent it. So the question people are asking is, what are you doing to stop the sale of this land to the Ministry of Justice? Well, the, I refer back to the answer I gave to the member for Aberavon, and that is, uh, we have written uh, to the MOJ with a number of questions. I've not seen that response. Uh, the response to those questions will form a part of our future consideration. Uh, they revolve around what the plans are, uh, for the site in terms of uh, the, the, the type of prison. They uh, revolve around 
what the future then is for Swansea and Cardiff uh, prisons. We've asked those questions, uh, and we are not in a position to proceed further with this until uh, we get answers to those questions, uh, and those answers must be satisfactory. Caroline Jones. Dear Lewis, uh, First Minister, Enterprise Zones should be a fantastic way of regenerating some of Wales' most deprived regions, but the reality is somewhat different. Some of the zones are working well, attracting private investment and rejuvenating their local economy. Others are simply operating because of government funding and support a handful of jobs. First Minister, if the enterprise zones were truly successful, there wouldn't be the land available to build a prison in one of the zones. What does your government plan to do differently to ensure that all enterprise zones attract private sector and infrastructure investment into their respective regions and create new jobs for local people? Well, they do, uh, but of course some will grow more quickly uh, than others. Uh, there will be some parts of Wales that, uh, because of their location, their geography, will find it easier uh, than other enterprise zones. But that's what enterprise zones are designed to do, to, 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 to overcome uh, some, of those, uh, some of those difficulties, as I said earlier on. We must judge enterprise zones on what they deliver in the longer term, uh, because, of course, much investment is put into infrastructure, investment is, is often put in for, for training, uh, and it's through the development of that investment that we then see jobs being created in the longer term. Question. Pimpton. Question five was withdrawn. Question six, Gareth Bennett. Uh, what steps is the Welsh Government taking to alleviate the increasing congestion on motorways and trunk roads in South Wales Central? Well, if we follow the advice of his former party leader, it's reducing immigration that's the uh, key to, uh, to doing this. But uh, tackling congestion is a priority focus of the Wales Transport Strategy and the National Transport Finance Plan. We'll continue to work with Transport for Wales to advance our vision or delivering a transformational integrated transport system in Wales, providing high quality, safe, affordable and sustainable transport for all. Yes, uh, thanks for the latter part of, of the answer. Um, I agree that integrated transport is crucial. Uh, one aspect I wanted to touch on was uh, lack of roadside information. Many motorists have observed that on major roads in England, there is often better information available on digital road signs than here in Wales. For instance, estimated travel times to particular junctions, which can warn motorists of imminent congestion. Would you agree that more digital information could be made available, and can the Welsh Government help to provide this? I'm aware of the signs I've seen in England, but I have to say they're not accurate often. Uh, I've uh, timed myself uh, when I've seen those signs, and then they well, how can they be? Because they, they can't provide for what's ahead in the traffic, what might happen. Any number of things can, uh, can interfere with the, uh, with the flow of traffic. That said, of course, we'll continue to keep under review what, what, in, what further information might be made available for drivers uh, in order for, for their journeys to be made easier. Vicky Howells. First Minister, flexible working patterns could provide one key to alleviating pressure on our motorways and trunk roads at key times. What work has the Welsh Government done to speak to big employers about the benefits of flexible working? Well, this is something, of course, we, we want to ensure is uh, very much part of working in the, in the future. Uh, in terms of flexible working, I can say that we have funded uh, travel plan, plan coordinators who have worked with employers across Wales to encourage sustainable travel. Uh, the travel plan coordinators worked with organisations from a range of sectors, including local government, health, education, anchor companies and regionally important companies across uh, Wales. Uh, and they provided advice and support on the measures that could be adopted by business to reduce car journeys, promote sustainable travel through the implementation of travel plans. And that, of course, means that it's, uh, as part of those measures, rather, uh, uh, advice was given as to how to promote active travel, car sharing, video conferencing, home working, and, of course, flexible working. Mick Antonin. First Minister, I very much welcome the uh, Welsh Government and Rhondacan and Taft Council investment along areas such as the 4119. But no matter how much we invest in the roads there, uh, they are becoming a congested noose uh, around the Taff Ely and the Rhonda area in, term, in terms of traffic. And the only real solution has got to be the extension of the metro, as been outlined in respect of Bather uh, through to uh, Lantricent. Uh, and I wonder, First Minister, if you can confirm that uh, those plans still feature as part of the uh, government's metro plans in order to resolve that, particularly bearing in mind the extent of housing development in those areas? Yes, because the metro is designed to be expandable. 
Uh, of course, the initial phase of the metro will look at what is already in place and the infrastructure that's already in place. I know there's a railway line. Uh, I don't know if it's entirely intact, actually, between um, the, the main line and with, with Bay there. I know the level crossing is still there. Uh, and indeed, yeah, it's, it's one, of the, uh, one of the issues that we will look at as the metro expands. How can we look at bringing services to areas where previously th th there was no equivalent service? Uh, what kind of service is appropriate for communities as they grow? How can we create the sort of uh, sustainable travel we want to see through putting in place uh, good value uh, and frequent alternatives? And of course, uh, as far as his considerations are concerned in Bether, looking at that uh, in the longer term will be an important part uh, of those plans. Tenoid question side. Question seven is withdrawn. Question eight, Clear Griffith. Thank you. Clear will the First Minister make a statement on plans to attract and retain GPs in North Wales? Well, Welsh Government is committed to increasing the number of doctors working in general practice in all areas of Wales, including North Wales. We know of the situation as it currently exists. has been raised consistently in this chamber with you. I know of up to seven practices in the Wrexham area alone, which are a threat of closure and many other in other parts of the region in the same position. Now, one of the practical difficulties causing problems is the situation in terms of the cost of indemnity insurance for doctors as a cost of over £10,000, possibly. Now, clearly, I wouldn't expect them not to have that cover, but it can be a very practical problem, for example, in trying to attract retired doctors Doctors back to assist in certain areas. The BMA have raised this regularly. We as Assembly members, I know, have received clear messages to that end. Can I ask you, therefore, what the Government intends to do to try and tackle that practical problem? Well, this is a very important point, and I would imagine that there has been an increase in the cost of indemnity insurance. Therefore, may I write to the member to give him the details that I can as regards this <clears throat> and as regards the British Medical Association. The, uh, many of my own constituents have faced receiving letters through the post regarding uh, their own local surgeries, particularly in the Colwyn Bay area, uh, being vulnerable to changes and indeed some of the GPs uh, have handed back their contracts to uh, the local health board. Now I know that the Welsh Government is working with health boards to try to overcome some of these challenges in the shorter term, but do you accept that one of the reasons we're facing a shortage of GPs is because of successive uh, Welsh Governments having failed to train sufficient numbers uh, in the past and are you now confident uh, that you have the systems in place to be able to attract the number of GPs uh, that Wales will need going forward? Yes, I am. The, the Cabinet Secretary will be making a statement uh, shortly to members on the definitive numbers recruited to the GP training scheme. But I understand this will show positive further recruitment, better than the initial fill rate of 91%, which I think have been, has been reported previously in this chamber. And that will represent significant improvement in our Welsh GP training numbers. Question now, Simon. Question 9, Simon Thomas. Will the First Minister make a statement on preparatory work for the process of awarding the Wales and Borders franchise? Well, may I refer the member to the further statement issued by the Cabinet Secretary for Economy and Transport on the 6th of November regarding the Wales and Borders Rail Service procurement? I thank the First Minister and I have read that statement, of course, which was, re was released as a result of the fact that Arriva Trains Wales had withdrawn from the franchise process. Now, reading between the lines and the reports around that, then that turns around the fact that Arriva had decided that there was no commercial value now in that franchise, including, of course, the metro and building upon the metro and that in turn reflects the fact that there is still reliance on a subsidy from Westminster and the responsibility being transferred from Westminster because this process hasn't yet been completed by your government. So what can you tell us today which can give passengers in Wales an assurance as well as the staff on Arriva Trains Wales in Wales, that those jobs will remain in place, that the services will remain in place, and that there won't be any problems in providing this franchise as you have pledged? Well, first of all, of course, there are issues who, to be discussed with the Department of Transport in London. There is no prob big problem, as far as I know, as regards proceeding with the process. It's not unusual for a company to withdraw, and we know that 
there are companies that are still part of that process. May I say that what we would have preferred to see is that a situation where the finance and the funding would have been transferred and that we could then direct network rail, but of course that hasn't been given to us, and that we would be given an opportunity to run the franchise as an arm's length body in the public sector, something which has been made available to Scotland but has not been gifted to us. And we are completely angry about that. And so there is no reason now why this should not proceed. And of course, it's something we want to ensure in order to see a better service for the people of Wales. Uh, First Minister, you're quite right to say that the decision of Arriva to drop out of the bidding process, the franchise process, um, does happen. Um, we shouldn't get too worked up about a bid deciding that, they, uh, that it's not for them. Um, at what point, however, did you know that they were dropping out? Was it sudden? Did they give advance warning? And I'm wondering, did the Welsh Government receive any feedback from the, the, the company uh, and the staff involved uh, that would um, be beneficial now moving forward with the rest of the process? Because clearly, uh, if uh, other uh, franchise businesses were to drop out as well, then we could end up in quite a tricky situation down the line, so to speak. Could I write to the member with the exact um, date on which uh, Arriva Rail Wales notified uh, Transport for Wales in that, uh, on that basis? As I say, it's not uncommon for bidders to, for major projects to withdraw during the uh, tender process, or even make clear that they've done this for their own uh, commercial reasons. Uh, and I will share what I can uh, with the member in terms of information surrounding the um, uh, decision. Well, I can. I mean, there will be some issues, obviously, that I can't disclose, I suspect, for uh, commercial reasons. Sean Gwenllian. A few weeks ago, it became apparent that New trains for the Great Western Railway service, which serve South Wales, won't include any bilingual signage or announcements. And as expected, there were a number of complaints made to the company by passengers following this news, condemning the decision taken, including by the former Min Welsh language minister, Alan Davis. Now, the company's excuse was that these trains serve areas of England as well as Wales, and therefore using bilingual signage and making bilingual announcement would be appropriate. Now, interestingly, some passengers in England have expressed support to having Welsh services in England talking about their experiences of travelling from one country to another in Europe and hearing the language change regularly. Now, ensuring bilingual signage and announcements on trains is a matter of fundamental respect for the Welsh language. So can you commit to ensuring that language standards will be introduced by the government in the transport sector, standards which have been on the government's desk for al almost a year, unfortunately, and therefore companies such as GWR would be able to provide services and the respect that Welsh speakers deserve. May I ask the Minister, therefore, to write to you about this issue? They're able to offer the service now, of course. It seems that the story has been told uh, in a way that suggests that this isn't possible at present, but it, of course, would be possible, in my view, because Arriva have used the Welsh language on their trains. Although the trains travel through England, they don't physically change the language on the signage as they travel through England, so there is no reason whatsoever why the Great Western Railway shouldn't use both Welsh and English. And I think that it's right to say that people would respect the fact that both languages are used and people in England would be very interested to see it. Question 10, David Rowlands. Uh, uh, will the First Minister confirm that it is the policy of the Welsh Government not to allow any new open cast developments in Wales? Uh, we will be consulting early on next year to, uh, on amendments to Planning Policy Wales to prevent new open cast developments in Wales. I thank the uh, First Minister for that confirmation, because, First Minister, we've seen a number of instances where companies involved in the open <laughs> cast industry have failed to honour their obligation to reinstate sites, either partially or wholly, uh, once activities have, ce have ceased. It seems incredible, then, uh, that the company previously owned in Foss Ivran, open cast in Merthyr has been allowed to rescind its guarantee of some £15 million by Merthyr Borough Council. The council instituted in its place an escrow account which the owners will be expected to pay into, thus effectively swapping a guaranteed sum of money 
to, uh, to one dependent on the efficacy of the new company. Is the First Minister able to shed any light on what seems to be an extraordinary decision? Uh, I can't. As a matter for, uh, for Merthyr Council, of course, they have the responsibility for enforcement of, of planning. Uh, I have seen, not, not for of Ryan, but I have seen incidences elsewhere uh, where open cast mining has finished uh, and still sites have not yet been restored. Uh, that is because, uh, to my mind, of an issue with the bonds that companies were, were uh, required to uh, produce uh, in the days when coal was privatised. There was, a, if I understand, a limit placed on the, uh, on the bonds they were required to, to place, and those bonds are not sufficient uh, to cover the, uh, the restoration of the land in uh, some cases. That is a historic uh, problem, uh, but it's a matter for the Council to, to explain. I'm not aware of the circumstances, uh, why it is that they've taken the decision they have. Question in Question 11, Leanne Wood. Will the First Minister make a statement on the white paper on the proposed Welsh language bill? Well, I'm going to add. Well, the consultation on our white paper, which outlined our proposals for a Welsh language bill, closed on the 31st of October. We are currently analysing the responses and we will make a further statement in due course. First Minister, many organisations have been in touch with me in order to express concerns about your intention to abolish the role of the Welsh Language Commissioner and to weaken the fundamental rights of Welsh speakers. But unfortunately, your government has accused the language organisations of being too conservative. Groups such as the Mentra Yaith and Midyad, Midyad Maithrin do a great deal to assist the language. Now, given the concerns expressed by many organisations and specialists in this area, is it now time for you to reconsider the decision to abolish the role of Welsh Language Commissioner? Well, we've naturally consulted on the bill itself and we're now going to analyse the responses that we've received. It's import vitally important that they are considered in detail. And the aim of the government is to improve the situation and reinforce and strengthen the rights available to speakers to ensure that we can attain the target of a million Welsh speakers by 2050. And so what we're now doing is considering the views of organisations and other bodies to see whether we can understand their concerns. Lisa Susie Davis. Of, uh, consideration. And can you, I wonder if you can tell us uh, whether, in examining the case for the new body to replace the language commissioner, the government has already uh, the government has considered, as it says in the white paper, how carefully. Oh, sorry. We need ha it needs to consider carefully how any staff might be affected and whether there will be transfers of staff. So can you tell me whether officials have already scoped the likely costs of TUPI, observing changing uh, pension and employment rights, and specifically the costs associated with managing individuals' data protection in line with the, uh, the new regulation, and concluded that, that's, that, that that kind of change is actually worth the money at all? Well, first of all, can I give uh, staff assurances that, of course, uh, when there is change, we want to make sure that, they're, that they are TUPI'd over, as the phrase has it, uh, and that we are in a situation uh, where people can uh, get uh, 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 an understanding of their situation as soon as possible uh, and, of course, get comfort as soon as possible. Uh, any regulatory assessment, of course, of the bill will follow the normal uh, process and members, of course, will have the opportunity to, scru to scrutinise that. Thank you, First Minister. The next item on our...